I just want to start saying uh, thank you for the in introduction uh, and that um, one disclaimer I want to make stepping in the I don't want to claim that anything that what I say is the ultimate truth. <laughs> I think that science uh, creates a lot of interesting theories, a lot of real interesting stories that allow us to interface with the world uh, in successful ways. Now we can build bridges, we can do fun things, but it's not the truth. So bear with me with my imagination, the fragment of my imagination. And uh, I'm going to actually ask you to start uh, with something that you are doing. So if you are not sitting next to somebody, go and sit next to them, because the two of you would do something together, really simple, but you will do together. So with the person next to you, um, you can come here and play with that. You're going to do something really simple that we can all, all do, you know, like uh, five years old, even two maybe, maybe even earlier than that. And you're going to do this. Uh, you're going to take turns, uh, and you will have uh, one person will do a gesture and a sound it can be whatever gesture, whatever sound, and that they start exactly at the same time and they end exactly at the same time. And the other person is just watching and seeing is the gesture and the sound starting exactly at the same time and ending exactly at the same time. So person A that is making the gesture and the sound does four or five iteration. Person B watches, and then you're gonna trade places, okay? So decide who goes first. Did you say four or five iteration? Iteration, you do four or five gestures with sound that start at the same time and at the same time. Yes? Different gestures and different sounds? Yes, thank you. And the other person just watches? The other person just watches. Oh, what happens at the same time? The sound of the gesture. The sound of the gesture start at the same time and at the same time. Okay. Maybe the two of you could do it together. No. No, different gestures. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, if you are done, uh, swap. The other person does. Hey, Tony, sit next to this gentleman that needs a partner. <laughs> And if you finish, have a little conversation about what did you notice? Did they start exactly the same time, then at exactly the same time, or something else? All right, and then bring that to a close. I know it's always fun to talk about ourselves. And uh, <laughs> did anybody notice that the person did maybe the sound first and then the movement after? Can, can you raise your hand? Did you notice that? 
Did you notice if somebody did the opposite, the, the movement first and the sound after? Okay, great. So this, uh, think about this. This, in a way, is the old talk. If you want, you can go after. <laughs> but it's like, uh, no, it was a very simple instruction. You start the movement and the sound at the same time, and you end the movement and the sound at the same time. But it's not so simple to execute. No? And in a way, it points back to these issues that we have in life a lot of uh, our words are not being fully aligned uh, with our actions. No? We, sometimes, maybe some of you have had that experience. You say something, and then at the end of the day, you didn't do it. No? Something happened, or you say something to somebody, and then you don't actually make it happen. So that's some, what I want to say is that we could be in there now, but we are not really always fully there. And uh, um, this is just the subtitle of what improvisation work could point to us. But um, the reason that I got interested in this in life was because somehow I was blessed to remember the moment as a child in which that now was not there anymore. I lived in the countryside and I usually spent a lot of time uh, playing around with trees. And then one day I was uh, uh, in the garden and I was having, looking at a flower, like, you know, this kid, for example, looks at a flower. He's totally absorbed in it, no? But I wasn't there anymore. I wasn't so absorbed in it. I was telling myself a story of how fun it was to be lying in the grass, smelling the flower. No? So it wasn't just this, like his whole face, no? it's morphed to the shape of the flower. But then it was more like this. No? Something had come in, maybe I'd gone to school, and there was something about that interaction with the world. There wasn't just me being there and having fun, or not fun, maybe crying if I cut myself, but uh, there was something else that was going on at the same time. And uh, I think that this type of relationship it then will bring us to have this relationship with nature. No? We can't be so present with it anymore, and so we trash it. And, uh, but the possibility is there. Now think about this beautiful drawing from Alex Gray. Now we can allow our action and uh, thoughts and words to unfold together. And uh, to do that, we imagine that we have a brain and a world, and that they are connected, and they are dealing with each other. That could be pretty simple. Life, in reality, maybe could be really simple. But what happened is that uh, we have this brain, we have this world, and the world tells us something, but then uh, our brain is engaged also in another conversation that comes in in the moment in which we bring in the right and wrong. And that conversation is a conversation that goes on here which is uh, about, uh, am I being right, am I being right, am I being wrong, am I being right, am I being wrong, am I being right? And that uh, takes away a lot of what we are, a lot of our body, to the presence, to the world. And not only, as I brought there, that can become a habit, this can become a habit, and we develop a lot of habits. Because uh, we have two things going on at the same time always, uh, you know, we can't really be fully where we are, and so some of them become automatized, and that some of the automatization are really complex, like in this diagram, but I, what I want you to see is that the automatization is craving, and that uh, you get all of these habits that none of us like, but we have also these other habits that we like, but that in some way come up from the same mechanism and not only that, they actually still contribute to separating uh, our being uh, to the rest of the world. Because even the biggest habit is taking you a little away to be present from what is. So, some of these habits 
are actually unexpected. And uh, to do, learn something about this unexpected, I would like you to go back to your partner, and this time you're going to do something slightly different. You can be three people, it doesn't have to be two. You're going to make a story with each other, one word at a time. Okay? So, can I use you as demonstrators? You start the story, say a word. Okay. So, maybe a little bit more cohesive, but could happen. <laughs> Something happens. No? <laughs> and I'm just teasing you. It was just exactly, I said it on purpose. But you are making up a story with your uh, partner, and you are just trying to go as fast as possible. Okay? Just do it. Do a, a couple of stories. If you don't have sitting next to anybody, go and sit some, next to somebody. You can be three in the back. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then uh, stop. <laughs> and again, chit-chat a little bit with your person or people and see what kind of things you noticed that stopped you to go as fast as possible. Okay. So, again, bring your conversation to a close. Hello, hello. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, could I hear any of the things that came up? What kind of, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> your body slow down to wait for your mind. Yeah, yeah that's a habit. Okay, so you found some meaning. You got attached to the meaning and you wanted to bring it forward. That was we had the slowing it down. The okay. Any other weird habits where creatures that come up with a lot of interesting explanation around things? Exactly, so how it's gonna look, that's a huge habit that we have, no? 
we don't allow things to be happening, we want to know how it's going to look. And uh, do you imagine that if we got rid of all of these habits, uh, <coughs> we would be that we do the shortest time to do this uh, game, no? that has been measured, like the shortest reaction time ever measured, no? What do you think? We could arrive to that. And that's for me is the unexpected part. Actually, I was just having a, recently a conversation with uh, John Kirkauer, who's the head of neuroscience and neurology at John Hopkins. And from studies that he has done, actually, reaction time, as we measure it, at least part of it, is also a habit. So if you account everything that we know so far from the moment in which, uh, let's say, is a reflex or a response to something, so the time of responding, the time of the, mass, the, the uh, cell to be uh, activated, to activate the muscle, the muscle to contract, there are still around 200 milliseconds unaccounted for. So something so basic that scientists have been studying for like 40 years, now reaction time is a solid thing. Part of it appears to come from a habit that probably was very evolutionary valid because waiting a little bit longer, you might learn a lot of things in an environment that is dangerous and wild, but we just carry it. We don't really have personally or uh, as a society anymore a need for this type of habits. So to look at this, uh, I end with uh, a physicist that will be acknowledged at the end of this, uh, start, decided to look at this now experiment. So what we're going to do is, what we do, we ask our subject to do is very simple. I'm standing still, I'm going to do the experiment for you right now. 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 So basically the instruction for the subjects and what I was doing is just to say now when I'm thinking that I'm transitioning between the state of being still and standing up and the state of walking in space. So if we look at time, I have a point in time that I know, <coughs> which is when the subject, in that case was me, says now. And then I can have at least two possible cases of when the now actually happens, no? when the transition actually happens. So I could have uh, that a person has uh, a systematic bias or a habit, and what they do is that they always say now, after the movement has happened. So this red line would be the times in which the movement actually happened and the now is when they say it. Or it could be that they simply don't have enough ability to pay attention where their words are and when their movement is, so that they say now, at some point that is around the time in which the movement is actually changing, but that it has a lot of variability in when it is, sometimes before, sometimes it's after. And then uh, again, if this is uh, the first possibility, it would show that actually this type of uh, very basic relationship could also be a habit, like the one we see in reaction time. And uh, I have to say, you will have to wait to hear the full answer of the story, but what I want to show you now is that, because this experiment just started, is this. First of all, that we can, from a video of me doing exactly what you just saw me doing, 
detect when I say now automatically, and we can detect the, the transition of the movement uh, in a very sophisticated way and precise way with the technique that is called timescapes uh, that basically look at uh, how a video changes in time. And here is like super preliminary result that I just got by this uh, amazing man, Alex gomez Marin, that works also at the Champalimau Center for the Unknown. And uh, um, the blue line is the movement, and the red line is the place uh, in which the person says now, which in this case is me. And you can see uh, that uh, in some cases at the very beginning, these are just 70 seconds of time. Uh, the uh, red line is slightly before the biggest peak of the blue line, and uh, then uh, in the very end, uh, uh, it becomes uh, completely aligned. And I have to say, it's been one of the most incredible things I've seen for myself. It touched me. I was like, wow, there is at least one moment in which I'm saying it <laughs> in the right moment. But independently from me, I feel that with this type of uh, work, uh, we can actually look at this systematic variation on something very simple. and. Uh, offer also uh, the support of knowing that that's a habit that you have. No? So if you want to then uh, be more free within the choice of life, knowing your own habit is going to be very helpful. And that's where the improvisation part of my talk really comes in. And if we look at the um, etymology of improvisation, uh, improvisation comes from, uh, well, come from the word provedere, which is a, a Latin word that says, uh, that means to make preparation for. So what improvisation really means uh, is to not make preparation for. So if we look at the, you know, what we are as human beings, usually we have a part of us in the present, a part of us that lives in the future, planning what we are doing, a part of us that lives in the past with our habits, for example. To make, not make preparation for, first of all, you, of course, you are getting rid of the part of actively making a preparation. No, that's implicit. But from what we just saw, you also have to learn something about your habits because your habits are things that came from the past to make preparation for something else that was coming. No? You waited a little bit longer in the bush so that you would be prepared to not be eaten by the lion. So you have to also get rid of everything that is in the past. And then this present that is here is a lot you know, closer to this sense of presence and present that, again, Alex Gray has been showing us. One way that I think is counterintuitive of how improvisation helps us to come to this present thing comes from this uh, beautiful quote from Raymond Kano that I'm going to read. The classical author who writes his tragedy according to certain rules he knows is freer than the poet who writes whatever comes to his mind and who is a slave of rules he does not know. So it's the part of the rule that you don't know. So these habits that we don't know are the ones that are actually affecting our action. And if you think about all that you know, no? All that you know, uh, you know how to, I know how to speak English, badly and with a bad accent, but I know how to speak English, no? I know that there are certain things I don't know, you know? I don't know how to build a spaceship, no? But there is a, a tons of things that, that I don't know that I don't know. For example, these habits, uh, like the one in the reaction time, even as a culture, we didn't know we had, no? And these things, uh, really affect our action because they are in our blind spot. So they hit you like the car hits you when you don't see them in the blind spot. Oh, why did I do that? 
I said I was going to do this, but I did that, no? And so what, to be present, you really want to be taking this and add load different pieces of knowledge so that you make a little bit less monstrously big blind spot. And uh, going back to the rules of Kano, what improvisation does, like I did with you, is that it gives you really strict rules. No? You had to say a word at a time. You couldn't say whatever word came up to your mind. You had to do the movement of the sound starting exactly at the same time and ending exactly at the same time. And when you have these walls, you start to see where your biases and unconscious habits are because you actually say you're going to do it, but as you all saw today, you actually don't do it. No? So you, ha you learn something about yourself. So, so far, we look at the fact that at some point there is this separation between word and action. Thanks. Maybe comes from something like socialization. There was a, the initial talk this morning in the, I have an Alzheimer moment, I don't remember the name of the person, but it was an MD speaking about how attachment had created all of the socialization problems possible. And uh, uh, that unconscious habits keep this uh, dissociation going and they make it wider. And that improvisation can allow us to find it again. So, so far we looked at unconscious habits, but also habits that we know do other things. They, sorry, I made a mistake. Limit our exploration, limit our imagination, and uh, in a conversation that came out with Rudy, which is here now, clearly just really simply limit our possibilities. So there is something about looking at this habit that seems could bring us in a juicy place. And we have a lot of habits, you know, we have evolutionary habits, we're afraid of things that we don't know why at this point we're afraid of, we have cultural habits, uh, we are terrified of death, we are terrified of failure, we have you know, things that um, prevent us to go anywhere. We have generational habits, you know? We are like uh, using steel, paper and pen to think, no? That's just a habit. <laughs> it's not gonna be true in my kid or anybody else. And we have idiosyncratic habits. For me, I realized with time and the fear of exclusion, uh, it was like really related probably to the attachment uh, uh, as a part of a habit. And um, many of these habits really affect our interaction. And uh, we have tools to discover them, and we, and we can find uh, ways. This is just a handful of things that, that I know, but there are a million of others. Uh, and we can find uh, new ways to be together in this world and uh, to be able to unfold, uh, like we saw in the initial uh, connecting uh, drawing from uh, Alex Gray, unfold our humanity without really necessarily create unnecessary suffering that comes from all of this friction, from our action not being at all aligned with our thinking. So, if you want to discover your now factor, the blah blah room still hasn't changed, but I would say it would be in front of the lobby. I would leave a sign where the place is. Uh, I would love to collect data on you, doing the very simple thing that I was doing, and be part of the experiment, and uh, um, be able to tell you also how your action and words uh, are aligned, at least uh, from this very limited temporal point of view. And uh, how long do I have? You've got seven minutes left. I have seven minutes left. I want to say something. This for me is going, and I, I'm going to stop because I want to ask people to ask questions. But um, 
this work is not something I have to show you. No. <laughs> this work, uh, uh, for me, is converging on actually taking action. And uh, uh, I'm spearheading a creation of a, a place for actively working uh, on social habits in social interaction and how they impact uh, the unfolding of society. It happens to be in Lisbon, because that's where I live, but also because uh, I feel it's a place that has a lot of potential. And uh, um, this place is, will be called Agora, Agora, that in Portuguese means uh, the now of the assembly. So uh, assembly now. And uh, it's really committed to let go of, of sustainability and arrive to thrivability because sustainability contains uh, the habit of scarceness and scarcity inside its own definition. And uh, in Lisbon, because Lisbon showed, uh, Portugal showed uh, that it is possible that things transform uh, without violence. Uh, I don't know if you know anything about uh, the um, Carnation Revolution, which was the end of the dictatorship in Portugal in 1974. It happened uh, with a song, uh, Grandola Villa Morena, played uh, on the radio at 12 o'clock, the 25th of April. Everybody stopped, and from that moment on, there was no more dictatorship. So, um, I could go more into this, and if you are interested in this particular project uh, or to the now factor, please come and talk to me, but I would love to have some time for questions. And so I'm going to stop here. <laughs> please. Okay, well, uh, um, one step that we know already, that we're already doing, uh, is the one of uh, changing where you are, moving. No? People do this a lot of times uh, when uh, they are actually not feeling that they are thriving where they are. And when you move, uh, you find yourself uh, not being able to implement the same habits. But in reality, that's not a very sustainable uh, type of uh, behavior unless uh, we all transform in a transnomatic world, which could be fun. But uh, um, I think that different things are going to work for different people. That's why I put on a, a lot of different uh, um, techniques, because maybe for you is paying attention to your body that will help you to see that. Uh, for me, it was a lot of uh, doing this type of improvisation exercises in which I could see that I wanted to make an action with my body, and even if I wanted, it wasn't happening. So then it started to open up. Uh, this is not so clear. How do I find clarity? Uh, but um, does that answer your question, or you wanted a more specific no, recipe? Yes. For, for my personal experience, the improvisation, and in particular, actually, contact improvisation, because it's one of those uh, situations that uh, confronts you with a constantly changing reality that could be potentially life-threatening. <laughs> it was really an interesting place uh, to find uh, <laughs> what habits I had that they maybe were not as useful as I would have liked it to. One more. What is your desired outcome from uh, Agora Agora? The desire, the super one, <laughs> world transformation. 
<laughs> it looks like starting with these. Uh, I have, a, I, if you want, actually, I can go a little bit. Now we have, uh, it has a shape. It one affect very particular issues in Lisbon. It has a location that we hope to be able to secure. It has uh, things that will happen in it. This is the pictures of uh, the location. It's a beautiful place in, in uh, the heart of Lisbon. And uh, the thing that I find interesting is that how can we use all of these tools we have uh, to allow the people uh, in Lisbon uh, to actually face globalization, gentrification, uh, and interfacing with new technology in a way that uh, is going to make the, the city really thriving, not just for the tourists that come, but for the people that live there. And as in that way, find ways in which this could be expressed in other locations. Yeah. Okay, I think that's all the time we have, but I'd Thank you very much. Thank you for being here.